Okay, thank you. I really appreciate the chance to be here. So I'd like to start by mentioning that there's a confounding factor in all the MECFS studies that we do, and that is that we have the problem that there's within group and between group heterogeneity. So it's usually possible to control uh, for age, gender, race, and this ethnicity, body mass index, the length of illness, but there's some other factors that are very difficult to control for. So for example, all of us are very, all of us in this room have different genetics, unless there happen to be some identical twins out there, and even identical twins have some, some differences in their genetics. Uh, their tw trigger may differ. People's immunological history differs. What diseases have you had in the past? What, what's challenged your immune system previously? Uh, people have different environmental exposures currently. The, even among patients, there's differences in activity levels and symptom severity. And of course, medications and supplements that many patients are taking, as well as the diet. So one way we can deal with this problem is to compare the same subject following provocation of symptoms or amelioration by treatment. And then that can give us some additional insights into the disease pathology. So if you have a, a patient who is bad and you can make them better, you can compare what happens as well as having a patient who's bad and making them worse, because then it can give you some insights into what's making them bad in the first place. We heard this morning a possibility of making a patient better by doing a fecal transplant. And as, as you heard this morning, we're going to be collaborating with uh, Peter Jonsson to uh, look to see what's happened with regard to intestinal barriers, whether they improve afterwards. We have another study uh, that will begin shortly in which we're going to look at some individuals who respond to the drug Amplogen small group of individuals who are known responders who are bad and will get better. And this is in collaboration with uh, Dr. Daniel Peterson and the Cimarron Research Group. And we hope to see what happens to people's uh, blood biomarkers when, uh, when they uh, are treated and have started to improve. Uh, a provocation study also allows comparison of the responses of healthy controls and, and patients. So you have a healthy person who's already pretty good and then challenge them and they're still pretty good. But you can take an MECFS person, challenge them, and they're bad and then they get worse. Then you compare to see what happens to, to the same patient, bef uh, same patient before and after, the same healthy person before and after, so that they serve as their own control. You don't have as much difficulty in controlling for the variation between individuals. Of course, you can also still compare between the patients and healthy people before and the patients and the healthy people after. But having somebody to be able to serve as their own control, I think it will be a very great help in figuring out what's going on in this illness. Now, the way that we usually make people worse uh, is to ask, the, ask them to exercise. So clearly, exercise therapy isn't something that people should be doing since they're going to get worse. Now, so uh, this is a cardiopulmonary exercise test, and we have the patients do the test, and healthy people do the test, and then they come back 24 hours later and do the test again. Now, after 24 hours uh, and after doing the test, most of our controls, even though they were sedentary, uh, are invigorated. They feel great. And I can tell you, I did this test myself as a control, and I feel it felt really good afterwards, and I thought I should exercise more. <laughs> but if you're a patient, you're going to have uh, indu induction of post-exertional malaise, and you won't be feeling better. You'll definitely be worse. So the advantage of a maximal cardiopulmonary exercise test is that you can get a lot of physiological data that uh, is listed here. All of these different factors are pieces of data that we can then use in analyses of how the uh, control and how the patient responded. It's also 
uh, the fact that the typical test requires only 10 minutes of exertion. A maximal test sounds really bad, oh, maximal test. But actually, some of the submaximal tests that people use are 30 minutes. And I actually think that's much worse for many people to be doing it for 30 minutes. So after 10 minutes, the, the challenge is over, and, and we've got all this data. Now, uh, our collaborator is, is Dr. Betsy Keller from Ithaca College, and she's tested now 94 different patients. Most of these patients came to prove their disability, and she's been able to group them into, into different groups, uh, de depending on whether they're VO2 max, their blood pressure, their heart rate, what, what was wrong, what went wrong when they uh, uh, had uh, a post-exertional malaise. So we're going to be able to uh, use this data to see if it correlates with some of the other parameters that we find changed in these patients after that we've induced post-exertional malaise. So I'm now going to uh, tell you about our uh, NIH uh, MECFS Collaborative Research Center. Uh, this is part of our Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease at Cornell. Uh, and I can, don't have time to describe all the work being done in the uh, Center for Innervating Neuroimmune Disease, but this is what I'm going to describe is what we'll be doing as part of our uh, NIH center. We have three research projects uh, and uh, several cores that assist us. And it's going on in my building here in, in Ithaca, New York, uh, in Manhattan, New York, at an imaging center at Ithaca College. And computational work is also being done at the medical school in New York City. So uh, with regard to patients, we are recruiting uh, 10 patients and 10 controls, all of whom are sedentary, uh, at each of three sites. So each year we'll have 30 and 30. So after the end of three years, we'll have 90 and 90. And so we have a site in Ithaca. Uh, we have two directors, uh, Betsy Keller and an MD, who are the clinical core directors. Susan Levine is our physician in New York City, and John Chia is our physician in Los Angeles. And the people performing the tests, the uh, cardiopulmonary exercise tests, are the individuals from the WorkWell Foundation. So these are our three research projects. And if you're wondering why we're all smiling like this, despite this being a somber subject, is this a professional photographer had a really good stock of jokes to get his subjects to, <laughs> to laugh. And so we, he told a really good one right before this was taken. So I'm going to tell you work being done by Dacoma Shungu's group at the medical school, my group uh, at Cornell, and Andrew Grimson's group at Cornell. So prior magnetic resonance spectroscopy studies by the Shungu group have already shown that there's increased uh, lactate in the brain and reduced glutathione. Uh, that's the increased lactate signal there. So there have been several publications uh, from his group indicating this fact. So why would you have increased lactate in your brain? Well, one possibility is that you're having a mitochondrial dysfunction that is causing your energy metabolism to dis dysfunction. And uh, that increases anaerobic glycolysis, and lactate is a, pro is a product of the anaerobic glycolysis. So he's already shown that's increased. But why are, is there a mitochondrial dysfunction? Well, we don't know why. That's what this cloud is up here that we hope to clear up by doing more research. But Whatever is, is happening up here is causing oxidative stress, and this glutathione being lower is, means that you can't mitigate that oxidative stress. So what's happening somehow, for some reason that we don't understand, is that toxic oxygen radicals are being created, causing oxidative stress. Well, what happens when you have oxidative stress? It causes a formation of some chemicals called isoprostanes in phospholipids. And that results in an activation of membrane-degrading enzymes. And when the enzymes are attacked by, the uh, membranes are attacked by this enzyme, then you have isoprostane release into the bloodstream. Now that has actually been documented that there's higher levels of isoprostane uh, in a paper uh, uh, in MECFS patients. And what isoprostanes are known to do is cause uh, constriction of your blood vessels. So you've got constriction, and that means then you have reduced blood flow. And of course, there's good evidence from a number of papers, including this one here, that blood flow is reduced in the brain. Well, once blood flow is reduced, you end up with some hypoxia. 
And hypoxia then can cause increased glycolysis because you don't have enough oxygen, and then you get lactate elevation. The hypoxia also can cause mitochondrial dysfunction. The mitochondria themselves can cause oxidative stress and produce those oxygen radicals. So you now have a vicious cycle that's been set up. The thing that we need to figure out, of course, is what's setting up the vicious cycle in the first place. But it seems like this is likely to be occurring. So to get more information on this, as part of the, the um, center's work, uh, the uh, Dacoma Shungu's group is going to put people in patients and controls into an MRI scanner to do more magnetic resonance spectroscopy, have them now also do uh, PET scanning. Blood will be taken, then they'll do an exercise test. They'll come back 24 hours later, do another MRI and a PET scan, do another exercise test. So they'll have information about how their, their scans change as well as how their exercise functions change, their physiological functions. Now, an important study in Japan uh, has reported that there's microglial activation. And as you heard earlier, microglia are immune cells in the brain. They have on their mitochondria, uh, here's one mitochondria, and of course these cells have a lot more than one mitochondria, we just can't draw them all. And they have a, a protein called TSPO on the outside of their uh, mitochondria. And when the microglia are activated, the amount of this uh, amount of this protein increases. So it's a good measure of activation and it's taken as a measure of neuroinflammation. Well, how do you find out how much TSBO is there? Well, it turns out there's a radioactive probe that can bind to this protein so that you can measure the amount of the radiation and then you can see if you've got microglia activation. And so that's what the study in Japan did. This is one example of a patient versus control and the the uh, bluish signal there shows you the amount of radioactivity. What was particularly interesting, I think, is the, the more cognitively impaired the patients were, the higher amount of the probe that was found in the brain. The, how, the higher amount of pain they experienced, the higher amount of the probe. So uh, Shungu's group was going to be doing this kind of measurement using the PET scans, and it's very important to replicate an important finding like this. And I know there's some other groups interested in replicating this finding as well. So I'll turn to the next project, which is the one that I'm the lead for. In this case, there's no imaging involved. We're, we're instead going to be drawing blood before and after two exercise tests and using that blood for a number of different, uh, uh, different assays. We'll be looking at metabolites, extracellular vesicle size and amount, the vesicle protein cargo and the RNA sequencing, and I have a number of collaborators involved in doing those experiments. I don't have time to talk about some metabolite studies we we've, uh, have ongoing, but they are looking very interesting, and we hope to have a publication out soon that you'll be able to consult. Let me just review briefly what extracellular vesicles are. There's three kinds. There's exosomes, you heard about this in the first talk in this session, uh, these very small extracellular vesicles. There's some, there's some ones that are somewhat bigger, micro, they're called microvesicles. They're made through a different process, a shedding process. And then as cells die, they release little bodies as well, which are also extracellular vesicles. So the interesting thing about these extracellular vesicles is they're present all over the body, not just in your bloodstream, but they're out there in tissues, and they carry nucleic acids, uh, such as RNA, they have proteins, and they're, they're used for communication between cells. So one extracellular vesicle released by one cell can go to another cell and fuse with it and then inform that other cell uh, of the status of the first cell. It also, they also are known to regulate immune response. What I think is particularly interesting in the context of this disease is the fact that these EVs, and I'll not call them EVs, cross the blood-brain barrier, and they thus may be involved in neuroinflammation. So this, this little diagram here is the rest of your body. This is all your body over here. The blood-brain barrier, these, these extracellular vessels can get through it and then fuse with a microglial cell and cause some effect. But, but by the same token, 
Brain cells also can send out these extracellular vesicles, and that is, I think, something that's exciting about them because it gives us access to things going on in the brain, which is very difficult to do without, say, a brain biopsy or a post-mortem analysis of the brain. So it gives us access both ways to uh, analyze what's happening in the brain. So we have done a pilot study of size and number in plasma of patients and controls. So we have 35 patients, 35 controls. Uh, the, these, this just shows the physical function uh, score of the uh, patients, obviously much less than the controls. The higher, the better. So we have a, a disabled group here. And when we looked at the uh, extracellular vesicles, we found that the smaller ones, the exosomes, exosome-sized vesicles, are actually increased in the patients. Uh, uh, the larger ones are not different, uh, it's not significantly different between patients and controls. Now, these samples were taken at the baseline without an exercise challenge. These were some samples that we already had that we wanted to see if there was already any difference. This is just uh, a, single, uh, a single patient who exercised, just to show you uh, what can happen. So in this case, uh, the, uh, before the first exercise, the number and size and protein content was uh, less in, uh, compared to afterwards. 24 hours later, the, the number went back down, but after the second exercise went back up. So this is not something, however, that is peculiar to uh, uh, people with ME, because it's been known for some time that if you put an athlete or a other otherwise healthy but sedentary person on an exercise uh, regimen, they, they'll also have an increase in their uh, release of extracellular vesicles. So what's really interesting is whether the vesicle content differs between patients and controls before and after exercise. That's what we really need to find out. So. Um, to, to do that, we're going to be doing some uh, RNA sequencing to find out how the microRNA cargo differs between extracellular vesicles. And so this is a, a vesicle. They do contain microRNAs. And microRNAs are particularly potent regulators of gene expression. They can uh, both uh, downregulate and upregulate genes and uh, are, are a very important aspect of gene regulation. So. If this vesicle, for example, fuses with some cell and it's packed with microRNAs that up or down regulate some genes, it's really going to affect the cell function. Secondly, we want to get protein profiles. So we'll want to be doing some protein analyses on these uh, extracellular vesicles to find out what proteins they're packed with. They can contain cytokines. They can contain other types of important uh, signaling proteins. And I'm just showing a few examples that people are uh, actually uh, using extracellular vesicles as diagnostic tools by finding differences between patients with various uh, diseases and uh, and controls, and presumably this might be something that would also be feasible in ME. I'll turn now to the third project being led by Andrew Grimson. Again, two, uh, people will exercise, we'll get samples before, uh, blood samples before and afterwards. And then, uh, because this is a horribly expensive uh, project, we're only going to be analyzing the, uh, he's going to be analyzing the uh, gene expression in single cells before the first exercise and before the second, after post-exertional malaise has been, uh, has, has been induced. And we think that'll give us a good idea of what's going on. Now, there have been, as you undoubtedly all know, there have been many reports of immune system abnormalities in MECFS. That's why I think calling the disease enervating neuroimmune dis disease is a perfectly fine name because it really is a neuroimmune disease. That, but one problem is there's been really inconsistent findings when various groups have examined RNAs from immune cells. These are just some of the reports that have come out. You heard about the common data elements today. Uh, I was on the committee that was looking at biomarkers and did a review of the literature, and I found that there are actually 46 publications uh, in which people have analyzed uh, RNAs from immune cells, and these are just not given a consistent story. So e even though there have been a lot of different findings, we don't have a major conclusion that comes out of these uh, many studies. 
So one of the problems may be that the previous studies of gene expression in the disease in immune cells have analyzed all the blood cells together or all the lymphocytes together. And as you can see from this diagram, there's lots of different types of immune cells. They're really not just one, one type of white blood cell. They're, besides BT and NK cells, there's all sorts of subgroups. And so one possibility is that there could be that one really bad actor that is causing everything and that we haven't identified it because it hides among uh, the population here. So by analyzing single cells, we may detect things that we have previously un been unable to do. So what we'll be doing is sequencing RNA in individual cells. You can actually make RNA from individual cells, go through a process that you can then analyze RNA from each individual cell now this isn't our data, this is uh, someone else analyzing a different disease, but each one of these little columns is uh, one cell's RNA levels, and you can see that there's a group over here that's very different from this, these other uh, people, uh, 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 RNA, other cells' RNA. So it will be, uh, it'll be um, very interesting to see how these patterns differ. Uh, each, each one of these columns is one cell's RNA. So we'll compare MECFS to controls then before and after exercise. And then the next last thing that we need to do, of course, is see if there's correlation. So if you have very high levels of uh, microglial activation, does that mean that you have a uh, uh, difference in your uh, cargo of your extracellular vesicles, different symptoms? Uh, you know, what, what's, uh, how, are the, how is this data correlated? Can that give us some additional uh, insights into, in, into the disease? And we have a, a data analysis core at the medical school. And we also, of course, are collaborating with a, a data management and coordinating center. They'll be making a lot of this data available for anyone then to analyze in the future. So what are our goals? We want to identify biomarkers. We need biomarkers for diagnosis. The biomarkers that you want for diagnosis, you want them to be specific as possible for MECFS so that you can just, just go to the doctor, have your blood drawn or your urine tested, and then you, the doctor will say, oh yes, you have this terrible disease. Uh, we also need biomarkers to develop treatments, and these don't have to be actually specific. If we can see something wrong, uh, in your blood, for example, and then we can give you a drug and, and the biomarker normalizes, then we know that the drug is working, even if it may not be, the marker may not be specific to the disease. Biomarkers can also give new understanding into the pathophysiology of the disease, and it might reveal some existing drugs that can improve the patient's condition. So that's really critical. There could be some drugs out there that have never been tried that actually could help, and we don't know about it. But the other thing is, hopefully it will indicate processes that are disrupted for which new drugs really should be developed. Thank you. I'll have a couple of, a couple of questions, please. Yes. Do you think that um, uh, one of the bad actors could be endogenous uh, retroviruses being expressed uh, uh, and causing problems? The, I know of at least one study that was unable to find any difference in expression of endogenous retroviruses. However, again, like many things in this uh, illness, uh, there needs to be replication of these studies and expansion with the latest methods. So I do hope that, um, other, that this will be pursued. It will, we will get some information about expression of endogenous retroviruses through our studies, through the single cell uh, uh, RNA sequencing, and I know there are other groups that are doing also immune cell RNA sequencing. So I think that that even though a group may not be specifically focusing on that question, that, that the answer will come out as to whether the, there could be an involvement of endogenous retroviruses. Thank you very much, Maureen, indeed. Yes.